Thank you for joining us tonight for the Fireside Chat with this year's Lifetime Achievement Award awardee, Jan Chatton Brown. Um, <laughs> as many of you know, each year the Environmental Law Section awards a lifetime contribution to the field of environmental law, environmental law award to a deserving recipient within our practice area. The award recognizes lawyers who have contributed to the field of environmental law over a sustained period of time, achieved excellence in the practice of environmental law, and provided legal services with high ethics and collegiality. Jan is the ninth person to receive this award with the first award given in 2014. Our goal for the Fireside Chat is to give you a glimpse into Jan as a person and as a practitioner. Most of you have probably seen Jan's name in published opinions and probably know of her generally. Some of you have probably sat across the table from her and litigated cases with her or negotiated deals with her. But we'd like to take time tonight um, to have her share with us some personal highlights and challenges that she faced throughout her career and that shaped her into the lawyer that we honor tonight. Jan's work as an environmental lawyer began in 1971. As a female lawyer in a heavily dominated field, she was a pioneer. Jan worked hard and graciously through her first 21 years in various public offices. In 1995, she opened her own public interest-oriented law practice in Southern California that is currently known by the name of Chatton Brown, Karstens, and Mintier LLP. Jan's leadership within her firm has resulted in important contributions to California's CEQA and land use jurisprudence. In fact, one of Jan's published cases is cited regularly by CEQA lawyers advising their clients on when is the appropriate time to start environmental review. Two of Jan's prized cases led to the creation of Rio de Los Angeles, Los Angeles State Park, and the State Historic Park of Los Angeles in Park Poor Environmental Justice Neighborhoods. In addition to her work life, Jan is a devoted wife and mother. Jan is joined tonight by her husband, Jack, also a former environmental lawyer, her son, Josh, who is now a partner in her law firm, Chatton, Brown, Karstens, and Mintier. He is a partner there. We're joined also by Josh's wife, Amy, and their children, Kai and Sterling. Jan's second son, Justin, is also with us tonight, as are his wife, Jess, and their children, Sebastian, dearly named um, Bash by his family, and Devin. Thank you for joining us tonight as we celebrate your amazing wife, mother, and grandmother. I'd like to take a moment to address one logistical item, and that is that we would like to address questions at the end of the question and answer period um, between Jim and Jan. And we'll take those questions by way of you jotting them down on the piece of paper that's been provided to you. If you are so inclined to fill that out, um, Samir will pass that around to you. You can fill it out, he'll collect it, give it to me, and we'll read those questions at the end. But of course, if the question doesn't dawn on you until the very end of the program and you wish to make your, your um, question known verbally, then of course we invite you to do that um, at the end. So with that, I am going to turn um, the program over to Jim Arnone partner at Latham and Watkins, a good friend and a fierce opponent of Jan's. <laughs> true, <laughs> true. <laughs> he doesn't give me any slap. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alicia, I appreciate it. Uh, before we get started with the fireside chat, I just wanted to share a moment of some personal reflection. Um, we're honoring Jan this weekend because of her decades of extraordinary advocacy and extraordinary success in environmental law. Um, I'm sitting here because of another element of who Jan is. Um, Jan is an extraordinarily professional, cordial person. And I've only ever been opposing counsel to Jan. And we've known each other for about a quarter of a century, and it makes me feel old even saying that. But we've known each other for about a quarter of a century, and through countless dinners, drinks, uh, terrific hike here just a handful of years ago, yeah. um, 
I'm very, very proud that we've been able to become good friends. And I don't think it's very common when people who know each other mostly in an adversarial way end up becoming good friends. And through challenging moments on personal levels, I've always been able to um, count on Jan for support, for a hug, for a good shoulder to cry on. <laughs> and uh, that's I awesome. think that's rare. And I think that uh, in, in addition to Jan's extraordinary professional accomplishments, I really appreciate that about you, sweetie. Oh, I happen to love so. this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to start our fireside okay. chat. And if you're wondering why it's called the fireside chat, it's because on that screen, <laughs> you can see fire. And we're I think, it's so much more ecological than it was in the past. I think with other logistical times, we might have had actual fire, but that's the fire we have tonight. So Jan. You've had a wide-ranging and extraordinarily accomplished five-decade-long career, starting when environmental law was really in its infancy. So please tell us, how did you get started in environmental law? OK. Well, um, when I was growing up, I was aware that um, none of the older people, none of my mom, my dad, my dad went to for one semester to college, but other than that, both he and all of my aunts and uncles um, had not gone to college. And when the older cousins and my sister went to college, they all went into teaching. Three of them went into teaching. And that just, um, I mean, I love children, and if I were ever going to do anything, it probably would have been a kindergarten school teacher, but I just, Every summer we would go to Sequoia. Every summer my entire life, except for one year, we went to Sequoia National Park for our summer vacation. And my father, when he was growing up, lived in Visalia and lived on a cattle ranch. And during the summer he used to take the cattle up into the mountains. And one summer he worked as a ranger in the park before it became a national park. And so it was a very special place to me. And I had not been to Yosemite, which of course is an extraordinary place, um, but I really fell in love with the Sierras. So I also was very aware. We lived in Long Beach, and they had all of these oil rigs. They were enclosed, encased, they, they had little islands. But it just made such a difference as opposed to when we'd go to Huntington Beach where there wasn't anything like that. And there were oil spills that occasionally happened. So it was definitely not a fan of offshore oil drilling. So in the late 60s, many of our prior, previously adopted environmental laws, you know, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, I think the Clean Water Act was enacted the first year in 1963, but they were pretty innocuous. But in 69, of course, NEPA was passed, and in 70, um, the then, um, governor in California signed the um, signed CEQA into law, uh, or corrected, correction, that was 72. <laughs> it was the Clean Air Act that was signed uh, into the amendments to it into law in, uh, in January of 1970. But all of these laws were passing endangered species, et cetera, and they were all going to hopefully help protect the resources that I really loved. And um, so I decided I'd go to law school. And I wound up at UCLA and was surprised and disappointed when I found there was no environmental law class. There was no environmental law society. And the women in our class amounted to 3%. It's just 3% of the class. I checked with a friend in the medical school, and they had 7% of their class were women. I thought, there's something wrong here. So it was great to try to 
begin to make a difference. Um, and one of the things is I identified people quickly that were also very concerned and interested in environmental law. You know, the 69 oil spill in Santa Barbara heightened a lot of people's interests about what the dangers of oil drilling were. And um, so we formed, a handful of us formed an environmental law society and we went to the deans and said, we need an environmental law class here. Um, we need to learn more about these various laws. And um, they hired somebody. Unfortunately, he was from the University of Chicago. And all he wanted to talk about was economics. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how to achieve reductions by charging more <laughs> for the emissions. Um, there's a lot of that that's happened as a result. But, Forward thinking. Uh, well, <laughs> it has its place, but it's definitely not the only thing that was needed. Um, I also, because of the Environmental Law Society, somehow, and I don't recall exactly how, was asked to go up and testify before the California legislature um, on, well, it could, it was either on the first version of um, the, I think it was both. I testified both at separate hearings on what became the, um, the energy, created the Energy Commission and became California's energy law. Um, and also CEQA. And in doing that, I met two people that, um, for, it was very fortuitous for me. Um, the first one and the most important one for me was Nick Yost. Uh, and we just clicked. And he told me that when I graduated from law school, the Evel Younger, who was the governor at the time, and was a real conservationist for whatever reason. I mean, some people said he was a conservationist because he had a lot of friends that lived in Santa Barbara that were upset. But at that time, there were a lot of legislators who were Republicans and were good conservationists. I'm sorry that's not true today. There are certain exceptions. <laughs> still. Um, but anyway, so Nick said, when you graduate, you know, maybe you can come and join the 10-person unit that had just been created. That was 10 persons statewide. Unfortunately, when I graduated, um, the AG, Evel Younger at the time, had a policy of you had to spend two years in criminal first. And I just wasn't more <laughs> able to bring myself to do that penance. Oh, I just hit my microphone and sorry about that <laughs> like no sound damage um, but anyway so and I thought about EPA but my all my family and friends were in Long Beach or Los Angeles and so I applied to the Los Angeles County Council's office specifically to represent the then Los Angeles Air Pollution Control District air pollution in the 60s and 70s in Los Angeles was horrendous. I mean, you could not see the San Gabriel Mountains from downtown Los Angeles. And even living in Long Beach, where I had lived growing up, and then Los Angeles, it was just really, you know, there were restrictions on a regular basis during certain parts of the year of people going outside, children going outside for exercise. And obviously, it was posing huge health hazards. Um, so I thought, well, you know, the APCD is a great one to go work with. They're now, that, then it was the Los Angeles County Air Pollu Pollution Control District. So I went and worked for them. And really, there were some good things that they did, but I felt like, you know, they were not very enthusiastic about most of my advice. <laughs> and so um, Nick called me and said, guess what? They've just agreed to change the policy. You can come to the AG's office. And um, I expressed my appreciation to the county council and the other people and to the APCD. 
and I happily moved to the AG's office where I had really wanted to be. And so in the AG's office, um, we were all around the state assigned different areas that we were supposed to focus on. And I had air, air quality, because we, I was in the most polluted <laughs> area. There were four offices, just as there are now, you know, San Diego, Sacramento, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. And, and endangered species, which I was very enthusiastic about because um, I love animals and different kinds of animals. And um, so I was very happy for a number of, well, maybe for the whole first year. But we had a procedure. When you wanted to file a new lawsuit, you had to put together a package with all the recommendations, what the issue was, what the basis was for your recommendation. And I had done that on a couple of things, but President Nixon came out with a brilliant idea of leasing 10 million acres of offshore lands for oil drilling. And I'm sure you're not surprised to know, I thought that was the worst idea in the world. <laughs> And um, so I put together a package, and Nick Yost approved it, and the next up to the up the chain of command approved it, but he who will remain unnamed sat on it for months and months and months. I asked, you know, what are the issues? What are the concerns? Let me try to address them, etc. Um, well, eventually some other states filed suit. So we were in a position that, you know, the best we could do was intervene or file an amicus brief. And the AG chose, I thought intervening was a great idea, but it would have been me meant that I would be flying back <laughs> to the East Coast all the time. So we filed an amicus brief. And, um, during that time, I mean, there, there were other things that were happening. Uh, one of the cases, strangely enough, that I did file a brief on, I filed a couple of briefs. They did, that section did a lot of amicus briefs at the time, as opposed to taking over whole litigation. And um, there were four young men from O'Melveny and Myers that had left O'Melveny because they got a Ford Foundation grant. And they set up the Center for Law and the Public Interest. Great guys. One went off to do, um, not, yeah, Scalda, the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund. Um, one became a lifelong friend of mine, Carlisle Hall, who stayed for a long time. Uh, Rick Sutherland, who was the one that went to Skaldaf, unfortunately was killed in a, he was in the mountains and killed in an accident. But um, Brent Rushforth, who moved back uh, during the Clinton administration, I think. Uh, and in any case, the, they had um, filed a suit on behalf of a group called uh, No Oil, Inc. And No Oil, Inc. was trying to prevent drilling in uh, Pacific Pal Palisades. And um, they got up to the California Supreme Court and they said, could you do an amicus brief? I agreed and did a brief and, you know, to my delight, they agreed they wanted to cede part of their time to me to make the argument. So here I am not two years out of law school, and I have my first argument in the California Supreme Court. Short, but sweet. Um, so I made the argument, and I don't know if it was good or not, but of course they won, and they did great briefing. But um, at the same time, um, it, you know, the people from the center became enthusiastic about getting me involved in things. So 
I was having this frustrated period at the AG's office, um, feeling like, you know, is it going to continue being like this, that we don't get to bring the suits, just file an AC brief, which is great, but I really want to be actively involved in stopping some of these projects. And um, so Bert Pines was elected city attorney. I don't know if you remember him, but after all, he was involved in judicial appointments during the Davis administration for a long time, so lawyers even not from Los Angeles probably know about him. Great guy, um, but he uh, had promised as part of his campaign, one of like two um, parts of his platform were blue skies for Los Angeles. And uh, so he decided he should set up what was the first environmental protection section in a local prosecutor's office in the country. And the guys from the center all recommended that he hire me. And it's funny because I, we had lunch not long ago with Bert and his wife. They were down um, in where we live now in San Diego County. And we had them over for lunch, and he had forgotten who, how I got there. He said, did you apply? And I said, well, not exactly. <laughs> I, mean, I guess somebody submitted an application, but you know, they had recommended, and then he kind of remembered that. Another thing that was funny that he re had forgotten was, um, and maybe I'm getting ahead of the story, but no, it isn't, at the, at the city attorney's office, so I, I agreed to move to the city attorney's office after about two years in the AG's office. And at the city attorney's office, I was initially only in charge of the environmental protection section, which is all I wanted to be in charge of. I loved that. Um, but then they decided I should become special operations manager, and that meant, you know, housing, a good cause, a pellet, which was kind of interesting. Um, there was one section that I didn't like at all, the special trials, they wanted to do pornography prosecutions, and, but consumer. But I still got to spend most of my time on environmental, which was, which was great. But there was a different direct supervisor of the environmental section. So um, my husband, uh, Jack, is over there, who, by the way, I think I fell in love with over the fact that he also loved to hike in the Sierras. And also, he's a great cook. <laughs> the first meal that he cooked for me was like a 12-course Chinese dinner that was just amazing. Um, and, uh, and he's a very loving person. So he came to the city attorney's office. He had, he had gone to graduate school back on the East Coast. He was going to go into business, so he went to MIT Sloan. And then he, after a while and teaching um, in a private school to stay out of Vietnam, um, he decided that he was going to go to law school. And we met when my best friend from high school married his roommate from MIT, and they introduced us, and we fell in love and got married. And after Jack graduated from my rival school, USC, um, <laughs> we, uh, he decided, well, you know, city attorney's office sounds good to me too. So he wound up applying. The people that were interviewing him did not know we were married. I, I don't know why they didn't ask about the Brown and the Chatton Brown, but I always went by Chatton Brown. And um, he wound up eventually going into the appellate section and we had to have a separate person supervised that part of the work that he did in the pallet section. But um, the story that I had with, with Bird is I had both of our children, our, both of our sons, while we were at the city attorney's office. And um, the first one, Justin, uh, was born at Cedars Sinai. And the next day, Bert sent flowers and called and um, to congratulate me. And before I, weeks before I went into labor, I did a long memo about why they should establish a policy until the city had a childcare program. They should establish a policy allowing 
you if, if it can be done without interrupting your productivity to bring your child to work when you're nursing. I mean, seems pretty. We did not have the same tools for pumping that they have today. Um, so it wasn't so easy to do. So when he called, I said, and about my memo. <laughs> and he said, well, how can I say no today? And uh, he said yes. And both of them I was able to bring. I mean, we had child care to help at home. But, um, you know, and I had a secretary that loved to, if I had a meeting that I had to go to that when Justin was born, my secretary was very, very happy to, you know, hand him a bottle or whatever. Um, but the, when Josh was born, our offices were back to back. And so I would just knock on the wall if I had to go to a meeting. Sometimes it was going to court. And he knew he had to pay attention. That was when he was in appellate. So anyway, I really enjoyed the city attorney's office. It was actually, the, even then, it was like 300 people. I think it's substantially bigger now, with civil and criminal. And most of what I was doing, there were all the criminal prosecutions for like um, air pollution, water pollution, hazardous waste. We did a lot of hazardous waste prosecutions. But consumer and the rest of those were civil, so I was getting exposed to both of them and enjoying that. Um, when Bert Pines left, a new district attorney came in, Ira Reiner, and I, I think he knows this. I did not like him at all at first. <laughs> <laughs> but I eventually, um, we eventually became very respectful of each other. And um, when, oh, and I forgot a very important thing. Um, while I was at the city attorney's office, a big part of what I did was actually fighting offshore elderly. And that wasn't in terms of litigation, although we did file one suit. It was Mayor Bradley, Tom Bradley was the mayor at the time. And he and Bert were really concerned about the proposals for drilling in Santa Monica Bay and other parts of the Southern California coast. So I wound up being the main staff person, and then there was a wonderful woman in the, that was staffed to the mayor that we coordinated. And we kind of you know, identified who the people were from the different cities that we could get that would be supportive, that would get involved, and we would have monthly meetings and would give them big reports about what, were, what was going on. And we submitted comments opposing the drilling, specifically in Santa Monica Bay, on behalf of this whole big coalition, which gave some political punch to the opposition in addition to the legal opposition. So um, as you probably know, there was no oil drilling that ever took place in Santa Monica Bay, thank goodness. And in addition, in addition to that, one of the things I'll mention later on was about slant drilling proposals that I also got to oppose. So um, even though it wasn't the kind of litigation that I originally envisioned, I, I did feel very fulfilled about it ultimately in fighting the good fight on offshore oil drilling. Hopefully we'll never have to do that again. <laughs> um, anyway. The, when Ira um, left the city attorney's office, he asked me to go with him to the district attorney's office and set up an occupational safety and health section. And one of the things I found, originally labor was all supportive of oil drilling, but I started talking to labor groups and a particular woman, an attorney from Kalosha that I got to know um, about how this was not a labor-intensive employer here, and there were better things that could, you know, to invest in. 
And um, some of the unions were pretty receptive to that building trades, obviously. Um, but, but other ones, and it kind of neutralized, I think, the outreach helped neutralize the support that they had been giving for the oil drilling. So um, anyway, uh, we wound, I wound up going over and setting up an occupational safety and health. And I would also get involved in environmental issues on behalf of the district attorney. And um, we had some interesting times. The one of the people, um, he wasn't a prime minister, but somebody from Australia asked me to go speak. And the then um, assistant district attorney, later elected as district attorney, said, well, you know, you have to let Ira do it. And I said, of course. You know, and I told Ira, you can go to Australia if you want. And he went, but they wanted me to go too. <laughs> so we both went, went, and both of our spouses went separately, obviously not on the Australian government's dime, but the rest <laughs> of it was. Um, so it was, it was another interesting period, but when he left office, the new DA was not somebody I felt I had the same rapport with. And so that was a time that I finally decided, hmm, what am I going to do? I guess I'm, uh, it's about time to go into private practice. And um, there were a number, you know, somebody said, well, you should talk to a headhunter who referred me to a number of big firms. And I talked to them, and a lot of them said, you know, you'll be able to do good things here, advising business, et cetera. And I just didn't feel confident that that was really going to make that much of a difference. Maybe you've made a difference, but I wasn't sure that I was that good of a talker. <laughs> and um, so, uh, and I had been in the AG's office when Clem Shoot, um, Mark Mahali, and Mark Weinberger were all there, and they were friends. And they said, well, do you want to open a satellite office for us? And I did that for a year. And there, it's a great firm. They're, they were great guys. Um, I felt terrible when Mark Weinberger died. And um, I, it's been a long time since I've talked to Clem, but um, they've been friends for very, you know, an ongoing friendship. But I thought, you know, if I'm gonna do this, I might as well do it on my own. So the satellite office lasted about a year, and then I went over to um, what's called the Green Court building, where Clippy was. And Clippy was there, and Tom Hayden was there as a legislator, um, and a couple of other public interest organizations were there. And it was just a great place to be, both for the camaraderie and the people to, you know, brainstorm with on issues, especially Clippy, who we wound up, you know, I had supported them much earlier. We wound up working together on a number of things. And one of their people that had worked in Clippy for a year or two was Joel Reynolds, who became a good friend and went to NRDC. And we worked on a lot of litigation together. So, so that was great. So it was just me. Oh, got to not do that. <laughs> it was just me for a while. And then um, I got busy enough to hire some people. And the first person, Jan Levine, who was Mel Levine's wife for a long time. Mel was a congressman that was a good friend. And his wife, Jan. I got her to come and work with me for a couple of years. She was She's a great, um, great lawyer, but she decided she wanted to go to the bench. So she wound up doing that. But we had fun. And um, one of the first big lawsuits that we filed was uh, involved the Los Angeles River. The um, LACTA, the Los Angeles County Department of whatever, um, <laughs> county, oh, I really, drainage? I don't know. Um, they decided they wanted to build parapet walls along the river. So we wouldn't be able to see the river, even in those areas where, you know, there were, even by then, some bike paths, et cetera. 
and um, they were going to channelize the whole thing. And most of the river was already channelized, but there were parts of it that are unpaved, that the water percolates in. There's vegetation that brings species up there. And so a new organization was fought, uh, founded by Lewis McAdams, a great guy, a great poet, by the way, um, called Friends of the Los Angeles River. And Lewis and I had become friends, and he asked me to start making comments on their behalf, et cetera, which we did on why their plan was a bad one. And um, so I worked with them uh, on it for a while, but it became very clear that Lacto wanted to go forward. So we filed a CEQA suit because their EIR was grossly inadequate. And um, the, it was something that, oh, and in the meantime, we came up with various strategies to enhance the public interest and see the value of having a natural river instead of a channelized river, or at least even if it remained in its channels, to let it be as natural as it could within the channels and still accessible, available for people to see um, and in areas where there is um, wildlife to be able to access that and to bike along the. Jack and I became very fond. There was always an annual bike ride along the edge of the LA River from Griffith Park down to Long Beach, which is a pretty good bike ride. And it's a lot of fun. I highly recommend it to anybody that um, lives in Los Angeles. But anyway, so um, we had filed the suit and then, of course, at the same time, you have to talk to the Board of Supervisors. So there were a couple of receptive Board of Supervisors to give me some direction to LACTA. And they finally told LACTA, and I must say, the County Council was somebody who I respected, we really liked each other and enjoyed, and she basically said, this is, she didn't say to me, but she obviously said to the county, we're gonna lose this suit. Um, and so they agreed to settle. The Friends of the LA River had worked with a professor at um, UCLA on coming up with an alternative system. I mean, he did very sophisticated modeling on various ways to manage the water through a watershed management plan. You know, where can this water go instead of just channelizing it? How can it be fed in to areas under parks, et cetera, to be utilized at future dates? And and used not only for flowing eventually into the river, but to be treated and reused. And um, so the county ultimately adopted a watershed management plan. Um, of course, the litigation did cost them something because we went to court and they said, well, we got this great settlement. We're entitled to fees for that. And that was the first big fee award that um, allowed me to feel much more comfortable that we were gonna be capable of actually making a reasonable living at, at this. And it wound up being more reasonable than I anticipated. <laughs> but Some of it, my was, it was better agree. than the government's <laughs> salaries. <laughs> Not consistent, but good when you got it. <laughs> anyway, so um, we did a lot of very enjoyable litigation, which you're gonna hear about later. And what am I supposed to, <laughs> I think one of you are supposed to answer, ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> that you're, doing, you're, you're, you're doing great, you're doing great. I'm wondering if we should see if there are questions. I think we should, oh. let's do that. Um, <laughs> I haven't gotten to Do talk. we have any questions? Did anyone fill out a card that you'd like for us to collect? Or would you just like to, Speak your question aloud, <laughs> that's totally fine. Um, well, I mean, if it will be recorded. Yes, uh, but we, uh, do we need a mic? Nothing yeah. embarrassing. Let's I don't know that Doug mic, gets Doug. a question. <laughs> we'll get you a mic, Doug. <laughs> it's a simple question. I was it would have to be. Like 
Well, you might want to talk about relationships with opposing counsel, or you might want to ask the question. <laughs> I'll, I'll repeat the question. So the question was if Jan and Jim could expand on their relationship um, that was demonstrated in the LSI um, seminars that they've given over the years. So. Yes, how's that? Okay, so I thought <laughs> professional courtesy. Um, it just seems common sense to me that no matter who your opposing counsel is, it does not serve your client's interest well to antagonize them. So, I mean, I think I'm basically a friendly person anyway, but, and there were some op opposing counsel that I did not really care for. But uh, <laughs> I tried to always be cordial. And I tried to be honest as long as I wasn't disclosing anything that my client didn't want me to disclose. And to establish as positive a working relationship as possible because of course, it's always, there's always the potential of settling a suit. Now, Jim and I have litigated suits, but I think we've settled more than we've litigated. Um, and you know, it's great. We found that we worked best over a margarita. <laughs> a margarita? Well, a few margaritas. <laughs> and he really had the advantage. If I have more than one, he has the advantage. <laughs> anyway, um, and I have to say, you know, one of the big cases that I had was the Save Terra case. And um, we had an oral argument. And Jim came up right afterwards and said, you did a great job. I mean, I don't remember exactly the words, but basically that. It was so, and I, I trust I said you did too. <laughs> but it was something that a lot of attorneys wouldn't do, I think. And um, it's, it's great to have that kind of a relationship. And plus, as you can tell, he's very funny. <laughs> And so um, we did wind up doing the LSI classes and enjoyed it very much. But in terms of um, the other attorneys over the years, I mean, I've had some attorneys, Carlisle Hall, who was at Clippy, and tell me if we're running out of time, um, was we worked together on matters for so long, but he wound up after Clippy folded, after the Ford Foundation stopped new grants, um, going into private practice, and we wound up being opposing counsel on the LAX expansion. And, um, but you know what? It's good to have somebody that you're a friend with on the other side because they help work through things. He was a rigorous advocate, and you've always got to do that, no matter how much you like um, the other, the opposing counsel. And of course, you also, can't be nasty and hurt, try to hurt the other case just when you don't particularly care for the opposing counsel. Um, but anyway, there's um, I think basically, we might have a question from you, oh, this I'm sorry. Here. Okay. Jan, yes. I was in uh, 1975 a Santa Cruz County supervisor just oh. elected and offshore outer continental shelf lease sale 53 happened and you just explained how you were deeply engaged in saving santa monica bay but i was from santa cruz and you were the heroine of that really? uh, i first knew you and i think it was when you were at the ag's office i'm not certain no. Do you remember how you got involved with the statewide effort that went oh, up well, into Northern California? We, that must have been, yeah, before the approval, it, because I was still there. Um, yeah, I guess I was there, 72, 73, 74. Well, yeah. I you were definitely left. engaged. <laughs> In Engaged. 1975 well, and on. I, I felt badly about just focusing on Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't. Um, yeah, no, that's good to hear. No. <laughs> uh, I could look back. Maybe I don't have those files anymore, but I'll think about it and maybe think of what the explanation is. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure, but it was probably, it was probably, and that wasn't when, I hadn't gone on the PCL board then. I mean, that's a whole separate thing. I have had a side career as an activist with various environmental groups. And if we have time and anybody's interested, but I don't think we will, <laughs> um, I can talk about that. But Did we have more questions? Any more questions? Any more questions? Well, we might have okay. uh, Do you so want it? One over here. Oh. Uh, oh. And probably don't even need a mic. Uh. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> so if I'm piercingly loud now, you'll know why. Hi, Jan. Uh, Congratulations for a very you. well-deserved Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you. One area where you are a constant source of uh, inspiration is as a pioneer and innovator uh, of the private public interest environmental law firm. I'm wondering, after the years that you spent uh, running a very successful example of one of those, uh, are you surprised that there aren't more of them now? Or are you surprised that there are any of them left? <laughs> well, actually, I mean, as everybody here probably knows and may have all been there last night. I mean, there are a number of firms. It's not just CBC and M anymore. It's Richard Drury and you do public interest law. I guess you're still your sole practitioner. Um, Tony Rossman was such one of the cases that is one that to me is, if I just should I just rattle off the cases that, okay. Obviously, Save Terra was very important. CBD versus um, the County of Los Angeles that dealt with climate. I did a lot of work on that. I did some of the work on the stickleback, which is this weird little fish, but we've got to preserve our species. Um, I didn't argue that case, but it was a real collaborative effort, and that was very satisfying. Um, I did get a chance to do more opposition to oil drilling, this time slant oil drilling from Hermosa Beach on behalf of, surprisingly, the Hermosa Beach Stop Oil Coalition. <laughs> um, why innovate when you can just add the name of the area first? Um, there were, oh gosh, so many cases that, as was already mentioned, I took great pleasure in, on behalf of Friends of the Ally River, stopping, helping stopping. And we work with NRDC, EJ groups. One of the great things about those two cases is it was totally in um, underserved communities, the park poor communities. And in two years, really in one year, three state parks were created as a result of efforts that we were involved in. We weren't solely responsible, but I, we were significantly involved. Um, we got new state parks for the first two that you already mentioned, and then one was in the Baldwin Hills, and the only thing that we had to do in the Baldwin Hills, it was in Culver City, it was land that had previously been used for oil drilling, and it was very unstable, according to the geologist that I consulted with, who is a professor at Stanford, a great guy, and I got him to come down and testify to the Culver City City Council, and you know what they did? They did the right thing. They denied the project. Um, so that wound up then being acquired by the uh, it was actually the Baldwin Hills Conservancy, not by state, but it became, that is part of a state park. So, um, let me see. I had a whole list of particular cases that I took great joy in um, being involved in. Oh, well, with you, um, the stopping the last major freeway proposed by Caltrans, the 710 freeway, and Tony Rossman, uh, who had been a friend for 
very long time, before we had kids. <laughs> and I met with the um, South Pasadena City Council on a regular basis, strategizing about how to prevent a second freeway. I mean, it's a little city and it already had one freeway going through it. And Caltrans wanted to extend the 710 and have a second freeway go through, decimating a resource that was listed on the, on the national list of historic places. And also going through El Sereno, a predominantly Latino area and displacing people. It was a horrible idea. And you know, although they always say, freeways will reduce pollution because it'll stop the stop and go, it gets to stop and go, and it increases the, pop, the pollution because then people just think it's easier to drive. There was a proposal that I worked with one of the um, consultants on for a low build alternative, which was to develop what became the gold line and to do some street improvements. And um, we had the, and Roger was working on, on the litigation once we filed it. We had the good luck uh, to get Dean Pragerson as our judge, who is Harry Pragerson's son. I don't know what that is. But <laughs> and uh, we got a great ruling on a preliminary injunction, and that was enough to put the nail in the coffin. Now, Monterey Park, is apparently still not happy. There's a book that I was interviewed for extensively, and I think Roger is, has or will be, um, and a lot of other people about what it took to stop that freeway. And it wasn't just the litigation. It was some very, very dedicated, amazing, both preservationists and, um, and you know, neighborhood activists that would were prepared to fight for their community. And in the litigation, we had, of course, NRDC was very happy to sign on to an AC brief, and NAACP filed whatever they called it um, because of the impact on, on Latinos. I asked them to do a letter, and they did way better than a letter. <laughs> um, and all sorts of people got, oh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, that was a key person, Betsy Merritt, if you ever have preservation issues, she's fabulous, she's a fabulous attorney. Um, so that was a great um, experience for me. And what were the other really big ones that I thought merited? You've covered a lot, Dan. You've covered a lot. <laughs> there are, I'm getting <laughs> reminders from, I had a whole list. You, you, um, you've covered a lot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the, um, ah, one, and a book recently came out on this. T uh, Lincoln Place, and Amy worked with me, as did Susan Brant Holly. There was affordable housing on a great street, um, a major street, Lincoln in Santa Monica. And it was historic housing uh, designed by, I think, one of the first well-known black architects uh, right after World War II, and originally as uh, federal, federally supported, but had transitioned into just regular affordable housing, nice, beautiful, open grounds, the kind of place that if you couldn't find afford your own home, you would hope to have you and your family live there. And of course, because it's a great location, a developer came in and acquired it and wanted to demolish all the affordable housing and build dense um, upscale housing. And so on behalf of the Lincoln Place Tennis Association, we filed suit. And there were many other um, avenues. The California Historic Preservation Group and others, uh, the LA Conservancy, um, all supported the effort to prevent the demolition. And we got a very nice decision out of the Court of Appeal um, to make it clear once again, when you commit to mitigation, you better do that 
unless for some reason you haven't discovered previously, there is no feasible alternative. And so they really held them accountable. This was definitely feasible, and I'm happy to say it's still there and it's still beautiful. I'm glad you did penance for Save Terra. Um, <laughs> and the... that is well utilized. <laughs> it is in a park and used by the community. It's just not a housing project. <laughs> so I think we're running a little bit long. In the, minute, okay. in the minute we have left, what's next for you and Jack? All right. Well, one, we very much enjoy spending more time with friends and with family. We just did a great fam We do a couple of family trips every year. We did a wonderful one. We took the family to my favorite place to visit, which is Africa. And um, it's just such an, I, I feel like it's a life-changing experience seeing both the people and all the, and all the animals and know what's at risk. Um, but what I'm spending, and we get, we're very conscious of the need at our age to get lots of exercise, so we spend a lot of time playing tennis, ping pong. We're going to try um, the... Pickleball. <laughs> the other <laughs> paddle tennis thing. Um, but we bike a lot and enjoy that and enjoy hikes, both in the mountains. We still love to come into the Sierras. We're going to stay and do some hiking up to Tuolumne and see Hetch Hetchy, which I've never seen, and back into the valley because yesterday we went biking. We didn't really have a chance to do some of the hikes that we usually like to do. But we have so many friends in LA, we have to go up there a lot. But the, all my spare time is basically, well, because of the election, I've been spending a lot of time on that. But other than that, I've been spending a lot of time on climate issues. And the one specifically that I'm working on now, on behalf and with a group called San Diego Sequel, um, w which is an organization that focuses on getting out all the gasoline-powered um, engines that are used in landscaping and beyond that, beyond landscaping too. But the worst ones are leaf blowers. So catch this statistic. This is on the CARB website. One hour of operating the normal gasoline powered leaf blowers emits as much pollution as driving a, v a 2017 Camry from Los Angeles to Denver, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy that last year, and the organization, a lot of other groups that we're working with, I'm working, once again, I used to be on the Coalition for Clean Air Board for many years, and chair for many years. Um, but the, they now have big staff, which is great, and they and a lot of other organizations are working for another bill to get additional funding, but for this year, there was $17 million allocated for, or no, $30 million, 30, um, that was allocated for expenditure. And 17 of that is going to be going to the project that we're hoping, which ultimately we'd like to see used to not just the, the project that CARB adopted, um, currently, there's hopefully going to be a different one with Carl Moyer project, <laughs> uh, provides electric vehicles, electric leaf blowers, at two-thirds subsidized and only one-third of the cost, making it much more affordable. The problem with it, in our opinion, is they don't require them to turn in the old gasoline power, so they're going to stay out there, and that is a big mistake in our view. So we're making efforts. We're going to talk to um, Assemblyman Member Berman about n making it explicit next time that in the next budget allocation that we hope there'll be next year, that part of the program has to be scrapping the old equipment. So as you can see, there's a lot of things I could go on. <laughs> well, we thank you, Jan. This has been fantastic. Um, well, it was fun. Wonderful to learn a little bit more about what was very personal and special to you. Um, so we would like to take this time to congratulate you again. Thank you.